from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Well, as you heard, Jacob of old wrestled with God. And Jacob would not let God go until he received a blessing. And so it is with the Canaanite woman as well. She too, grabbing hold of this heavenly man, Jesus, would not let him go until she received a blessing as well. For clinging the way that Jacob did, he's renamed Israel, one who struggles with God. And for clinging to Christ, the Word made flesh, the Canaanite woman is praised for having such great faith. Did you know this? Jesus Christ never told any of his disciples that they had great faith. Not a one. And yet they left everything, everything for his sake. He said this only to one other person, another very minor figure who doesn't have a name, just like the Canaanite woman. And that, of course, being the heathen centurion from Capernaum. Pray with me. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Well, Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us, Faith is the conviction of things not seen. Meaning that our reason, which typically loves to lead God and direct us, takes a back seat to what is revealed in the Scriptures about Christ, how He defines reality, how He defines truth. And thus, when suffering comes, and most of you know that suffering will come, it is incredibly tempting, tempting for us to then abandon our faith and trust in our blind and fallen reason instead. The Scriptures don't tell us how, but the Canaanite woman, she has faith in Jesus. What? A Canaanite? I know. The Canaanites were outside of the covenant the Lord God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were an old pagan race of idol worshipers. And thus the Jews wouldn't go near them. You don't talk with them, you don't eat with them, you don't touch them. Marry one? Forget it. Out of the question. They were dogs. And dogs in this culture, they were not like dogs in ours. I mean, we treat our dogs as what? As members of the family. To them, dogs were scavengers. That's why that story that Jesus tells of Lazarus who is out, on the, uh, out in front of the rich man's house who has the sores and the dogs come and lick the sores, that's supposed to make his original hearers like gag. What a risk it was for this woman to come to Jesus. Yet again, she has faith. Faith in Jesus, who is the substance to which her faith clings. Beloved, faith is not an abstraction. Faith is not an idea. Faith is not a concept. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is a heartfelt confidence in the grace and the goodness of God, which is learned and revealed through the Scriptures. Somehow this woman has heard of prophecies of the coming Messiah. And she's recognized Jesus as being the one who was fulfilling them. Moreover, she's heard what Jesus is doing of His healings, of His miracles, of His gracious acts of mercy. Faith cometh by hearing. And particularly, she's heard of how Jesus, with a mere word, expels demons from poor sufferers, sufferers just like her daughter. These reports have found fertile soil in her heart, and now, where it is, Jesus has come to her far corner of Galilee, and now she's crossed the border, so to speak, to come to Him. 
She waits anxiously, and upon seeing him, she offers her fervent prayer. She cries, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Lord, have mercy. We know that. And we know it well. I mean, that's a common refrain. It's, Lord, Lord, help me. That's what it means. Help me. In Greek, it's Kyrie eleison, of which we chant or we sing or we say with, with great regularity around here. It is the cry of the church in all ages. And why is that? Because we need God's help. We need God's mercy. And gratefully, this is what He shows. He shows mercy. He takes pity on us in our misery. But along with her cry for help, she adds, Son of David. Now that's a messianic title, of course, one that is loaded with meaning. You see, God made a promise to David that one of his sons, someone from his genetic line, would be a greater king than David bringing peace and reigning forever. This son of David, this Messiah, this Christ, would usher in a glorious reign of blessing for Israel, which in turn would bless all the other nations of the world. However, as you know, most Israelites, they did not believe this about Jesus. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the son of David. But she does. She does believe this. This woman knows her stuff. We would say she went to Sunday school. She knows her catechism. Yet to her prayer and her great confession, Jesus says nothing. God's silence is the worst kind of silence. But all of God's saints experience it from time to time. And I would dare say it is the greatest test of our faith. I mean, the psalmist laments it saying, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Or this one. To you I will cry, O Lord my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Our Lord Himself experienced it on the cross, did He not? There He experienced the greatest silence of all, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, folks, think about it there on Golgotha. The sun is withdrawing its light. The constellations are crying out. And all the while, God is silent. It is the worst. Now I have no idea what went through this woman's head at this point where Jesus says absolutely nothing to her. But my guess is if you or I were snubbed by Christ like this where He was silent as a stump in your deepest hour of need, you might begin to wonder, is He really that good? Is He really the helper that I've heard about? Is what I've heard even true? Have I been duped? Or is all of this just make-believe? The hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah, some friend. You see, the default mode of our sinful nature is to begin to doubt God's Word, to doubt His goodness. Boy, I tell you what, when we do that, we're thrown into the torment of uncertainty, and right on the heels of the torment of uncertainty is despair the inky blackness of despair. 
and I, for one, would not wish that on the devil himself. It's awful. It's crippling, actually. However, faith is not misled by God's silence. Nor does faith dwell or, or meditate on what is not true. Instead, what faith does is it clings steadily and firmly to the report, to the message, to the promise, to the bare word alone. This woman, she continues to press Jesus for help, even though, even though Jesus seems to be acting contrary to who she knew him to be. Even the disciples are shocked by what is happening. Why is Jesus acting so harshly towards her? Why is Jesus acting so brusquely towards her? I mean, he always helps people in their misery. They can't take her anymore. They can't take it. So they, on her behalf, ask Jesus to do something. I mean, look, she's not going away. So help her. Finally, the silence is broken. Jesus explains, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's a deal breaker. The divine plan was to work out redemption in the Jewish nation. Jesus wasn't going to move his ministry headquarters up to Tyre and Sidon or any other Gentile area. As soon as it was worked out in Israel to that stubborn and stiff-necked people, as you know them to be, it would be carried out then to the rest of the world. So not only does Jesus ignore her and walk on by, but now she hears that she doesn't make the cut, that she's not one of the chosen. You don't belong. So what does she do now? Does she abandon the word and go back home? Does she keep trying those homeopathic remedies for her daughter, her demon-possessed daughter, that she knows will not work? Does she forget all that she's heard and believed about Jesus? Does she do that? That's our temptation. It's not hers. This woman clings to the Word even though it feels like it's being forcibly torn out of her. She does not turn away from Jesus' silence, nor does she turn away from His stern answer. She still trusts firmly that His goodness is hidden behind it. She does not believe that Christ is or can be ungracious. So while Jesus is explaining His mission to the disciples of Him being the glory of Israel and afterward being a light to lighten the Gentiles, as we will chant in just a few moments. This woman runs around in front of Jesus. She falls on the ground in utter humility and the deepest appeal and she begs, Jesus, help me. Lord, help me. And He directly tells her that she is a dog. She is unworthy to share in the children's bread. Put another way, she's one of the damned. She's one of the lost. She is completely unworthy to share in the blessings that He bestows. This sounds more like the devil than it does Jesus. But what is Jesus doing? He is drawing out this woman's faith. Folks, it's why He chose this Gentile re uh, region to be in. He is there for her. Does He want to help her? Of course He does. Persons who have a hungering heart and a broken spirit, they're the favorites of God, as we learn about in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus wants to answer her prayer and give her all that she needs, but we can't tell that just yet. 
He's showing his disciples and thereby us what faith looks like, which means believing that Jesus is merciful and that he keeps his promises regardless of the suffering that we currently experience. Is it a hard lesson to learn? Folks, it's one of the toughest. I see it all the time and so do you. As soon as suffering comes, people determine that God is not compassionate, God is not kind, God does not care, and that God is not merciful. Something goes wrong in life. Some curveball comes out of nowhere, hits you square in the nose, and that will always happen. And the temptation for so many is to punt their faith. The first thing, why God? And guess what? God does not answer that question. They punt their faith, they stop praying, and they stop coming to church. They think, what's the use? And you know exactly what I'm talking about. The interaction between Christ and the Canaanite woman shows us that sometimes Jesus hides himself in order to exercise our faith. The faith he gave us, by the way. Doing so at the absolute, it seems, worst time. Namely, when you're bombarded by temptations, you're suffering, suffering under your own sin and the sins of the people around you. This whole time, this woman has overlooked what she sees and what she hears and what she feels. She believes Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but somehow or another, He can bring her into that fold. She believes His mercy is wide enough to embrace the likes of her, and she doesn't give up. And though we're taken aback by the harshness of Jesus' words, she is not. She says, Lord, if that's your word for me, then I'll take it. He calls her a dog. She says, yes, Lord. So as if she says, dogs never had it so good under your table. Because you're not going to let them starve. It's as if the words of the intro that we sang earlier were emblazoned, uh, emblazoned already upon our heart. Remember, O oh Lord, remember your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from of old. Of this, Luther says that she's trapped Jesus in his own words, and he loves it. She's got him. She's not about to let him go. Just like Jacob of old, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's exactly what this woman does. And to this, our Lord says, Woman, your faith is great. As I said earlier, there are only two people from Genesis to Revelation who are praised for their faith, and she is one of them. For hers was a faith that doggedly clings to Jesus even when he appears to be silent, even when he rebuffs her, even when it seems that he is rejecting her outright. For he will not despise a contrite heart. And now warmly and gently, Jesus says to her, let it be done for you as you desire. And at that moment, the demon leaves her daughter. So folks, as we struggle with the Lord, as the Canaanite woman struggled with the Lord, even when he seems to be silent, we say, Lord, give me the strength to not let you go until you bless us. We show Him our empty and our longing hands, believing that He never gives His children stones for bread. Never. So, is Jesus merciful? Well, the Canaanite's woman voice cries out, yes, He is. I would even argue that the Canaanite's daughter says, yes, He is. The Holy Spirit certainly cries out saying, yes, He is. And faith agrees saying, yes, He is. And may the Lord continue to grant us such faith.
through His Word and through His Spirit. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offertory. We stand together.